personality disorder, and which makes him vulnerable to depression, but also makes him a bit sort of hyper and manic, and you know, in his acting, he's very crazy. And um, and I like that because he's not like a regular guy in that sense, but he's very clever and he's very politically aware, mm -hmm. which you don't, you can't say for most Hollywood actors. Do you think we should start? Because we might be waiting some time, but that's not fair, is it? Mm -hmm. Everybody's here, right? Yeah. I think we're going to start. Mm -hmm. So, um, it's crazy to spend one hour talking about Hollywood, but um, here, here begins my crazy lecture. Um, I want you to think about Hollywood. Well, let's think historically, like we did at the beginning of the course. Does anybody know when Hollywood began? Historically. 1960s. Much earlier. Much earlier. It was the 30s, I think. I can't give you an exact year, but the whole Hollywood studio system, which at the time I believe was like six major studios, <laughs> it began not long after the invention of cinema. Here she is. And Obviously, early Hollywood cinema was very, very different to what we have today in the sense that early Hollywood cinema was silent, often, black and white, and, but it was always industrial. Hollywood has always been a commercial corporation, so it fits into some of the political, economic, and Frankfurt School of Marxist arguments that we make about commercial media. Yeah? It is about profit. It is about entertainment. Yeah? Yeah? <laughs> and so, um, if you follow the historical trajectory of the line from the 1930s through to now, so maybe about 100 years, has anything changed in Hollywood? Has anything changed? It becomes more commercial. If anything, it's become more commercial, absolutely. But one of the central debates about Hollywood is, is Hollywood successful? Is it popular because of the monopoly that it has financially and economically? So it has a very strong business model. Mm -hmm. It has a very big domestic market, and most of what it exports is profit. Yeah, that's what we, what's, that's what we call um, scale. Um, economic scale. Um, but at the same time, we're also aware that Hollywood has some kind of global appeal, doesn't it? There's something about Hollywood that makes us attend to Hollywood. Now, so we've got this, is it successful because we don't really have a choice, because most of our national cinemas are dominated by Hollywood? Mm -hmm. Or is it because there's something peculiar, something good, that's not the that political economists can't identify something to do with quality about Hollywood. Now, before I tell you what I think, does anybody think that, you know, most of you are familiar with Hollywood, right? In your home countries, that's most of the films that you see. Yeah. Is there anything particular about Hollywood that makes it exceptionally good? What, why do you like Hollywood? I just made my mind. <laughs> Can't white, believe you just said that. White people. Really? <laughs> because are, are you really, serious? I'm, I'm, listen, I'm telling you, not, not because I agree with that, but like I do believe that we tend to we we tend to prefer we need to prefer these kind of um, so films or movies because it's made by those people. So you're making the cultural imperialist argument right there. White people make better cinema. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying this is what I do believe, but I do right. believe that it's it's for like the majority they prefer to watch these films because they do believe it's made by the better people. Better in terms of they're just knows what they're doing. But this is not this is not my own belief though. But have you watched say I mean, I gave you an example of Tarkovsky, that was Russian. Yeah. Have you watched any Korean cinema, Chinese cinema, Bollywood? It's getting there. I mean, I could give you a whole list of amazing films that are not made in Hollywood, seriously. Like by by, Hollywood, like by white people, you know. 
So I do, but I think you're absolutely right. I think the general expectation, in, even in terms of quality, is Hollywood is guaranteed quality. Which takes me to the next point, because I want to talk about Hollywood narratives. Narrative is an academic word for story. There are some film scholars that argue that every single Hollywood cinema, sorry, every single Hollywood narrative is essentially the same. Why would someone argue that every Hollywood narrative is the same? What makes every Hollywood story similar? Because they are very much similar in their narration. How it starts, mm -hmm. the peak, and the ending. We know, sorry. Sorry, I'm very excited to say this <laughs> line, that's why. <laughs> and I was, I was to say that it starts in a way, it's like big, and then there's this peak that's always similar, in a way. And then there's ending, this happy ending. It has to have a ha happy ending, in a way. All right, so let's start she at the said it. Let's, happy ending. But let's start the at the end. Yeah. So there's something about the ending that's appealing because it guarantees yeah. satisfaction, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. happiness. Mm -hmm. In a, in academic speak, we call it closure. Mm -hmm. C L O S U R E. Now, in that sense, what makes Hollywood different from advertising? It's an advertising model. Mm -hmm. It's guaranteed. Happiness. Do you remember we talked about yeah, happiness yeah. last week? Yeah. Now, if we go to the beginning of a Hollywood typical narrative, I'm going to argue, and you can disagree with, with me if you like, just think about it, test it in your minds. Every Hollywood narrative story begins with a normal situation, an ordinary situation, a situation of order, everyday reality, like now, right? Everything's ticking along, the world is going round, the, the status quo is, is fine. Then a problem happens, the problem has to be uh, solved. Um, a, it could be a natural catastrophe, it could be aliens landing on the earth, it could be an axe murderer, it could be um, uh, some guy loses his girlfriend or whatever, but it's got to be a crisis, it's a problem that creates uncertainty. And then the narrative will resolve itself by the equilibrium, I'm using that word, balance being restored. So order. So someone that has someone usually has to come in, usually an individual hero, white, western, good looking, just your point, and fixes it like a Superman, right? Spider Man, you name it, right? And that makes Hollywood ideological, right? Why does it make Hollywood ideological? Because number one, it's saying that individuals are more important than society. They are more important, right? It's also saying, if you, again, another way of looking at Hollywood narratives is they are all based on the psychology of the um, actors, of the, of the characters. So we never get to know them politically. They are never seen in a political context. Mm -hmm. There is never a Hollywood movie that really challenges political power. So they are conservative. Hollywood movies have a conservative bias. They are designed to make you feel that anything that goes wrong politically can be solved by a good person doing the right thing. Yeah. Now, is that the same as the world? Yeah. No. Yeah. yeah? It's just pure escapism. So in that sense, you can see how it's very ideological. It's, it's, it's kind of having this pacifying effect on audiences. Now, it's not to say, as human beings, we all need our pleasure and our satisfaction and emotional well-being. It makes perfect sense to watch a movie that makes to make you feel good. There's nothing wrong with that. But if there isn't a choice, if it's just that, and also take a Hollywood historical film, it's always from the perspective of the West being better. It's always the perspective of America, you know, actually changing history. And, it, and it's really shocking to say this. So many people today, when they're asked a historical question about what happened in history, they think they have the correct answer from a Hollywood film. Mm -hmm. My God, that's so dangerous, isn't it? Yeah? More than the news, more than history, more than scholarship. Okay, so we're going to start with The Truman Show. 
Some of you haven't seen it. Um, I'm going to play you the trailer, and then I'll talk about why I think it's an amazing Hollywood film that does not fit the typical standardized conventional description of a Hollywood film. Um, and then we talk about lots of other things. So let's just watch this. the Truman Show, what is the disequilibrium in the narrative? If you've got a little clue in that trailer, what happens to Truman? Who is Truman, do you think? And what happens to him? Some of you have seen it, so you must remember. Yeah. I mean, I would say that the Truman is us in everyday um, life. And the moment where Truman, Truman I don't want to like Ruin the film for people who don't watch it, but like. Yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we are Truman, and the moment he realized that he's living in, in a set of reality for him, uh, I think these moments where we realize that everything around us set us, sets either via advertising or, um, I don't know, like, it depends on the situation we are having these kind of moments of realization okay so he's so he's a normal guy yes right he wakes up he has this normal life it's very white it's very clean white picket fences he goes to work he's very friendly he's very american have a nice day all of that stuff right and he realizes gradually that something is wrong, wrong. what is wrong he realizes that emo the emotion that of the people around him is fake he realizes that he is being influenced to do things and to be with a woman that he doesn't love. He ends up marrying a woman who is not his original lover. And he, he realizes that it's all fake, it's all a setup. Mm -hmm. So what's really clever about The Truman Show as a Hollywood film is it's, it, it kind of represents our psychic reality in commercial mass media. And what do I mean by that? I mean that every, he's a global product, he's like a celebrity. Mm. And what's happening is that everybody is watching him. 
and it, it, it's kind of like a, a, an explanation or a description of narcissism. So our Western culture, our mediated Western culture, teaches us that we are most important. Advertising says you are the most important. You're the center of your world. You, you make the world uh, work for you. So it, it represents what I'm gonna be talking about next week when we talk about the internet, how social media and reality TV make us the product. Because we are the celebrities, yeah. Yeah. right? It also uses product placement, so he advertises and his wife advertises products, yeah? And yeah, it's actually, I want to argue, as well as The Matrix, I, I want to argue that it has a spiritual quality as well. Because it's like he has to escape from the illusion of his life. He has to escape, and if you watch the ending, which I'm not going to tell you, um, you see that, that something happens at the end. Yeah? yeah. So, just to get back to my notes. Now, this description here, I want you to read in your own time, guys, if you haven't already read it. I'm not going to go through it now, but it's just for those of you that are not familiar with The Truman Show. But these are the points that I want to share now. Truman is a global brand a product placement. Now remember we talked about object, objectification. Yeah. He is the object for the audience. So the, the audience is part of the story in Truman Show. That's what makes it so clever. It makes us think about our role as, as the audience. As I said to you already, he's promoted by reality TV and social media. And it also is the fact that you can see, you saw in, in the trailer, there are these cameras everywhere. So it's a bit like reality TV Big Brother. It's like every aspect of his private life is broadcast publicly. Yeah. And, and, and he doesn't even know it at first. So it's promoting the private, so the public, the publicization of private experience, which is voyeurism, you know? People spending all their times on their screens watching other people instead of actually being in the present within their right brains in the, in the moment. Yeah. It also promotes something that I'll talk about next week, which is capitalist surveillance. And this is the idea that we are increasingly putting our lives online, yeah? Mm -hmm. And we're actually interfacing with each other through big data. So it's like Facebook. Like, so you meet someone, and instead of actually talking to them and getting to know them, you look at their, you look at their profile on Facebook, yeah? That's a form of surveillance. We're all doing it. Um, that's what we call surveillance. So what I'm arguing is that he is the right brain inhibited by the left brain. So this is all about the material, materialism of um, modern, capitalist experience and obviously I think the Frankfurt School would agree the viewers in the story think they're watching a star and here's the irony because this is celebrity he's actually a prisoner he can't escape this image he is not the real you know he's he's pretending he's made to pretend yeah so hence why he has a kind of emotional meltdown Mass media makes reality and becomes reality. So that's, it's looking at that really interesting area where the more we use the media, the more we become the media, and the more we cannot distinguish between what's mediated on the screen and the real world. This, we're all getting confused about what's going on in the world and what, what meaning is, because so much of it now is filtered through commercial media yeah, and political media. Uh, he lives in a picket fence, almost white utopia. Um, he becomes aware of his entrapment in a representation and attempt, attempts to escape. He does this mentally and literally. Okay, so that's all I want to say about The Truman Show. And uh, let's move on now to genres. And who knows what genre means? Like a time? Yes. It's like represent the time, like movie genres. Yeah. What what is what does it mean? It's a French word. Yeah. 
So it means type or sort or kind. Okay, so we all have our favorite um, Hollywood genres, do we? Do you have your, a favorite genre? Yeah. What is it? Mine is comedy and reality. Rom comedy and reality. Oh, reality TV, yeah, okay. Rom com like comedy or reality. Yeah, rom comedy. Fair enough. Yeah, anybody else? Action movies? Any one horror films? No. no. Yes? Okay. So what makes genres in Hollywood so successful is that they appeal to audiences, but they also appeal to media, to Hollywood producers. The reason is, when we know, just like advertising, just like um, <coughs> commodity fetishism, we know what our favorite genre is, so that it guarantees a certain amount of satisfaction when we watch it. We know that a new film with, I don't know, Tom Cruise in it um, has, okay, it's gonna be Tom Cruise, we know what style of film it's gonna be, it's gonna be action, but there's gonna be something new, yeah? So that's just like what advertising is. You, you consume this product, it's new, you need it. From the industrial perspective, it guarantees a certain amount of profit, so you know that, uh, that there's a certain proportion of, of audience that's going to consume the film and you're not going to make that much. Generally, Hollywood doesn't lose money because they do so many tests with audiences to guarantee that it's popular and successful, which is why Marvel is so successful because most Marvel films are, are similar, but they have something different, but they know that it's the most popular genre, so you can't lose. You know, So the business side of Hollywood always wins. Mm -hmm. This is why... I'm arguing that The Matrix and uh, The Truman Show are creatively unusual, mm -hmm. yeah? Uh, 